All right.
you're on your way to hell. Uh, some churches call that anathema. That would, one example would be the Roman Catholic Church, unfortunately. Um, and he's told to be, uh, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. You know, we're all going to experience that first death. It's the second death that we should be concerned with. Works are important. Let's go ahead and put that out there right now. Works are important, but they do not save you. You are rewarded based on your works. For good works, you're going to receive a good reward. For bad works, you're going to receive the, the compensation for that as well. Um, again, we've talked about this before. God says, I put before you this day life and death. That's the Torah. Blessings and curses. That's the Torah. Life and blessings if you obey death and curses if you do not. Okay, uh, we're going to delve into a little bit about what's the end times. Uh, the end times uh, in John chapter 10 verses 22 to 24 now it was a feast of dedication. That word dedication in Hebrew is Hanukkah in Jerusalem and it was winter. So this is the, the festival that happens in the winter time uh, around Christmas, our Christmas, or people's Christmas. And Jesus walked in the temple on Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So they're wanting to know. They, they keep hearing his proclamations that he is the one and only Messiah. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 it says, The thing that has been, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. What this basically is saying here is God's word, God's prophecy works in patterns. You know what? We're seeing the same things today that we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah's day. We're seeing the same things today that Jesus dealt with in these particular churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, and in Pergamum when we get to that one as well. So once again, prophecy is pattern and pattern is prophecy. Daniel chapter 11 verses 31 through 34. And arms shall stand on his part, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, we're going to stop right there for a second. The abomination that makes desolate. This was actually fulfilled already. Josephus tells us in 168 B.C. that this has happened. But it will happen again. When Jesus talks about this in Matthew, he talks about it in a future tense. So we know that this will happen again. This will be the abomination of desolation that stands in the third temple declaring himself to be God. That's when you know we're really close to the end times. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among all the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoils many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help but many shall join them with flatteries. So basically what this is saying is, uh, the road to damnation is broad, and it's easy. It's Broadway. Many can find it, many want to go down it, and that is the easy way to go. There's no uh, persecution, there's no argument, and people just do it. So that's the easy way to go. But the road to salvation is narrow, and few will find it, and it's difficult. When you get on the road to salvation, there's going to be all kinds of stumbling blocks that are put in your path. We need to remember that. Matthew 24, 3. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? 24, 4, 15. Therefore, when you see, see once again, in forward tense, in future tense, therefore, when you see, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoever reads him, reads this, let him understand. So once again, this has already been fulfilled uh, by Josephus. It records this in 168 B.C. But Jesus 
in the first century, it's saying, when you see this, that's future tense, so it will happen again. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Now I want us to talk a little bit about something called uh, tribulation. There's a few different people, there's a few different positions rather out there, different positions. Now it's not a, uh, a salvation issue. If somebody believes in pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, uh, that we're currently in the tribulation, whatever. The fact of the matter is, I'm only concerned with what the scripture says. And there is no pre-tribulation rapture in the scripture. Every time you see the, tri the tribulation, it's after the final trumpet call, the seventh trumpet call. It says, and uh, in First Thessalonians, it says, and on the seventh trumpet call, then the dead in Christ will be raised first, incorruptible, imperishable, and then those of us who are left alive will be called up to be with the Lord. So once again, I have never seen any, any type of uh, validation of a preacher at rapture in the Bible. And because iniquity shall abound, this is Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Let's look at a couple of definitions here real quick. Iniquity, what is that? Iniquity is sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Those who practice sin also practice lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Okay? So now we're talking about those who reject what God says to do. The love of many shall grow cold. What did Jesus say love is? If you love me, then you will obey my commandments. Now, because of this iniquity, because of this lawlessness, they don't love Jesus anymore. They walk away and they love something else. They put something before God. This is one of the highest forms of idolatry. You idolize something other than God. Then let, the, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Now we're talking about the tribulation. Jesus is now talking what's going to happen when you see the tribulation. That's Matthew 24, 16. Then you go to 24, 20 through 21. But pray that your flight is not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath day. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus is foretelling in the future the coming tribulation. But he's presupposing that those who believe in him will still be keeping the Sabbath. Oh, by the way, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is the Sabbath. Today is the day, the seventh day of the week, that we are called to set aside to do things like this. To study God's Word. To have rest. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with doing good on the Sabbath. We had to get moved today. A lot of people would say, and legalists, legalists would do this. Legalists would say, oh my goodness, you went out of your house and you turned the car on and you struck a fire because, I mean, those engines, they, they have little fires in the... Uh, in the engines, you can't do that. The Bible says don't strike a fire on the Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with doing good on the Sabbath. The Bible literally says, Jesus is talking to the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he says, which one of you guys, if you saw your neighbor's ox in a ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't pull that ox out on the Sabbath? So he's pointing out their hypocrisy. This, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. This is super important to remember. Should we try our best to keep it every single time? Yes, we should. Absolutely. We get blessed when we do that. But do we live in a culture that allows us to be able to do that every single Saturday? Nope. We sure don't. And you know what? It's okay. God understands. Now, God has desires for us. Don't get me wrong. God wants us to do certain things. But he's also very understanding when we can't keep a particular obligation. He knows our heart. He knows why we're doing what we're doing. And that right there should be scary. And then shall great be great tribulation. So right there, Jesus is saying that then the great tribulation comes when you see these things. Such has not been since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. He also says in there a little bit later that if he didn't intervene, that the world would not survive, that it would be over, game over. Uh, in Revelation, 
chapter 2, starting verse 12. Now we're going to get in on our study. 2 verse 12, we're getting into Pergamum. Pergamum is the third church. Now we're going to learn a little bit about them, about what they are all about. And to the angel of the assembly of Pergamus, right. Let's stop right there for just a second. Remember that the word angel there can mean messenger, and it can also mean pastor. It can be the person who's actually leading the flock in that particular uh, assembly. Remember we also talked about the word church is a relatively recent word. It's only been around for about 1,600 years. Before the word church was around, it was assembly. So, and to the angel of the assembly in Pergamus write, These things say he which has the short, sharp sword with two edges. I know thy work. So we're three out of three. This is the third church we've talked about. And this is the third time that Jesus has said, I know thy works. And where thou dwelt. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Even where Satan's seat is. Uh-oh. Now, we've gone from good to, uh, to really good to now we're really bad. They dwell in Satan's seat. And thou hold fast to my name and have not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas, my faithful uh, martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelt. Wow, Satan dwells. And right there, I've got a little cartoon picture. Uh, and I want you to think about something. Do you think Satan's really going to look like that? Do you think Satan's going to look like all red and horns? And, you know, he's, he's going to... Do you think Satan's really going to look like that? No. You know what he's going to look like? He's going to look like Joel Steen. He's going to look like some of these prosperity, prosperity preachers who look really nice in their suit and tie, tell you everything that you want to hear. But they're not telling you the things you need to hear. So that's what we got to be aware of. When you look at Psalms 146, verses 6 and 7, let the high praise of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. So now we're figuring out what that two-edged sword is there and what that's all about. Now, it's also about the story of Balaam. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the story of Balaam, Balaam was a prophet, a prophet of God. And this prophet of God actually sold his abilities for money. He was a prophet, and God used him as a prophet, but he was a wicked prophet. So let's look at Numbers 22, verses 31 through 32, and this tells us a little bit about Balaam and what happened with him. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. Now up to this point, he's been riding his donkey. He's had this donkey for most of his life. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord standing with the sword. Balaam doesn't see it. The donkey stops in his tracks and says, I'm not going any further. I'm, I don't want to get killed. Well, then Balaam beats the donkey. Still doesn't go. Beats him again. Still doesn't go. Beats him a third time. Still doesn't go. Finally, he's just like, I'm, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right now. And then that's when the angel of the Lord, it was shown to him. And he bowed down his head, and he fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass, again, beat your donkey, these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. we got to remember what a perversion is. A perversion is using something in a way it was never designed to be used. Balaam is using his ability to prophesy for the living God, and he's using it to make money. That's not what it was designed for. So back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. But I have these things against you, because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, the doctrine of Balaam, what did Balaam do? Balaam was trying, uh, uh, Balak was a king, and he wanted, he wanted Israel to be cursed so bad. But the Bible says those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And even though Balaam was trying to sell his uh, prophetic abilities for money, he could not curse Israel. It was not in his power to do so. But you know what he did know? He knew the word of God. 
And so the doctrine of Balaam was to say, oh, guess what? We can't curse them directly, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach them how to do things that go against the word of God. We're going to teach them how to marry outside of the nation of Israel, those who believe the same way that they believe. When Jesus says, do not be unequally yoked, there's a reason for that. Because you'll start to follow. If, if, if a man gets married to a woman and that woman has no desire to go to church and has no desire to learn anything about God, but that man's a godly man, guess who's going to win out in that relationship? Yeah. More than likely, it's going to be the woman. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. Okay, everybody say this with me. To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Why is sacrifice to idols first? Because this is cannibalism. This is not just taking a hamburger and say, oh, oh let's go ahead and, and offer it to Artemis here over here in uh, Ephesus and then eat the hamburger. No. This is, these people were actually following Balak, uh, Bel, uh, Baal Polem, and also Moloch worship. And they would actually kill their babies, cook them, and then eat them. Wow. This is crazy. And to commit fornication. So, you also have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We've already talked about that. Those are the ones who reject the law of God. Which thing I hate. Remember, if God hates something, we should know what it is so we can hate it too. So, once again, let's look at Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. And Israel abode in uh, Shittim. Sh Shimtum, Shimtum, and the people began to commit whoredom. Now, when the Bible talks about the people doing these things, it's like in Jeremiah where it says, We were whoring around on every high hill under every green tree. This is idolatry. They began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people unto sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat. So now Israel is eating the same things that everybody else is eating. They're not being holy. They're not being set apart the way they're supposed to be. And bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. That's, again, that uh, particular leader who had started off this uh, human sacrifice. And the anger, anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel because of all the sinning that they were doing. Now the validation for this is in Psalm 106.28. They joined themselves unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. That is human sacrifice and cannibalism. Okay, let's move on. Revelation 2.16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's the word of God. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say unto the assemblies. To him that overcome, I will give the hidden manna to eat. And will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knows, saving him that receives it. This is pretty cool. Uh, this is also in Isaiah, but it was also uh, a tradition of the Romans and the Greeks. If you were accused of a crime, a high crime that could actually incur the death penalty... And you were acquitted of that crime. Well, everybody might know that you were once guilty or, or being charged with that crime. They would give you a white stone with your name on it. And if somebody said, I know who you are, you were guilty of that crime, you could pull out that white stone that would only be given to you if you were acquitted of that crime. But it's also came in the Bible first, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek. Of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he mentioned my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. And the Gentiles shall see the righteousness of all the kings, thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So once again, that's that new name that only God will know. 
And that's in Isaiah 62, verse 2. Um, when we look at this, these are attacks. And we're being attacked from the outside, and we're being attacked from the inside. We're being attacked from every side nowadays. From the outside, in Numbers 31, verses uh, 15 through 16, Moses said to them, have you led all the women, uh, let all the women live? Behold, these are Balaam's advice. See, Balaam was the one that said, hey, look, God said go out and kill everybody. Because, again, when God levies righteous judgment on a people group, there's a reason for that. When God says, I want you to smite all the Amalekites, the Moabites, and all those other ites, there's a reason for that. So, but Balaam said, hey, you don't have to worry about that. Go ahead and keep the women for yourself. And that caused them all problems. Uh, Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, again, Baal Peor. And so the plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. The plague. So now we've got all these problems that have come upon Israel because they didn't obey what God said to do. That's the attack from the outside. Then we also have the attack from the inside. You know, in Exodus... In Exodus, they created a golden idol, a golden uh, calf, in order to worship that. Why did they do that? They didn't do that because they were trying to worship another god. They did that because they had lost their mediator, Moses, between them and God. So if you look at Exodus 32, verses 5 and 6, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to, and it's the Lord in all caps. Whenever you see Lord in all caps, that is the word yod Hey vav Hey or Yahweh. That is the God of the Bible. So this golden calf has nothing to do with worshiping a false god. The reason it's shaped in the calf is because the very first letter in the Hebrew language is an aleph. The aleph is a pictographic symbol of a bull, a calf. And it's the picture of the strong leader, the head of the house, the father. That's why he made it that way. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, if we, if we just look at that, it sounds like, well, maybe they went to the park. They went to rise up and went to go play. Uh-uh. They were engaging in sexual debauchery. They were having orgies and all kinds of things. They rose up to play. That's what that means. They were engaging in sexual perversion. Now we're going to talk about a word here. There's a word here. Uh, I'm going to give you a definition. It's called syncretism. Syncretism is the combining of different beliefs while blending practices of various schools of thought. Like in Christian, uh, Islam would be blending of Christianity of it in Islam. You've heard of people like uh, Rick Warren. Uh, Rick Warren said, uh, and recently, I can't remember the, the black guy's name, who's the comedy that used to be, at the, anyway, but he came out and said, oh yeah, it's, uh, Islam is just like Christianity, just without the Bible. Wait a minute, no it's not. They're totally different positions. But uh, Rick Warren literally coined the term uh, Islam because he said we can blend the two that we believe in the same God. No, we don't. It's the blending of two different positions, and you can't do that. God hates blending. The blending of Torah and Greek philosophy. That's what the Greek philosophy of the early church fathers, trying to incorporate Greek philosophy into the Torah and saying that they're both good. The new covenant was not designed to be a blend of pagan customs and teachings of the Bible. It was not designed for that. When you look down here at John chapter 6, verse 58, it says, This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. That's Yeshua. That's Jesus. He is the bread of life. It's really cool how that works. The second letter in the Hebrew language is uh, Beit. That's where we get the word Beit Lechem or Bethlehem, the house of bread. And what did Jesus call himself? The bread of life. Okay, let's continue. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. And to the angel of the assembly in Thyatira. We're moving right along. We're, we're getting into our second church already today. Thyatira, write these things. Say it, the Son of God, who hath 
his eyes like unto a fire of flame, a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works. Okay, we're four for four. Every time he's talked to one of these, these churches, these assemblies, he says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works uh, and the last to be more than the first. Well, he actually mentioned works twice. This is the first time he's done that to a particular assembly, mentioned the works twice. Well, where do you think John got this picture, this picture of Jesus? That would be in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. His body also like uh, the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in the color of polished brass. And his voice of his words like the voice of a many multitude. Wow, that's pretty cool. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou suffered that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed unto idols. So once again, we've got fornication. This woman's not doing what God says do, and be offering things to idols. Uh, in Exodus chapter 34, verses 12 through 16. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, wherest thou go. Why does God say this? Because he wants us to take over the areas where we go into, and not those areas take us over. Wow. And that is true today. When we go into an area, when we go into a community, when we go into... Uh, a school, a work environment, wherever it is, we are, as Christians, to take over that area for God. I'm not saying conquer it and kill everybody. What I'm saying is we're to be different, and we are to be a treasure possession before God. We are to be different than the rest of everybody else. That word is called holy or set apart. We're not to blend in with everybody else and do what everybody else does. Lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee, but ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Now, this is all referring to pagan worship. This is how they would do that. Uh, destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Their altars were generally something called an asherist pole. We might call something like that an obelisk today. Uh, destroy their images. They would make graven images unto other they would make images of uh, animals and, and different things of that nature and cut down their groves. Why do you think it says cut down their groves? These are evergreen trees because the, the fertility practices of the day, they looked at evergreen trees as being always alive. And so they looked at that as a symbol for fertility and they used that in their fertility worship. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. Is jealousy always wrong? Mm, that's a tough question, isn't it? I use this when I'm teaching, because I, I ask the kids that. Is jealousy always wrong? No, it's not. If I'm married, and I am, and my wife and I are out, and my wife starts paying attention to some other dude, I'm jealous. Why? Because her attention is mine. It's due to me. It belongs to me. And I want every single bit of it. And so when anybody else is getting her attention, they're going to know it. Same thing is with God. We owe God every bit of our attention, every bit of our worship, every bit of our adoration. And when we don't give it, He lets us know. Again, the Torah... Blessings and curses, life and death. Let's see here. Have it to the land, go to the covenant. 
make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, go whoring with their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. Maybe I'm on the other end. Walk where I will. There we go. Okay. He thyself goeth and snare in the midst of thee, and they shall destroy their altars and break their images and cut down. For thou uh, worship no other god, for God is a jealous God, and a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods. See, God considers that unfaithfulness. Why? Why does he always use marriage terminology? Because we as the church are to be the bride of the Messiah. In the end days, when Christ returns, he's not going to be coming back for a foreign body, a foreign bride. He's coming back for his bride that he knows that is waiting for him. In the parable of the ten virgins, those are the bridesmaids of the bride. And we are the bride of the Messiah. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after they, their gods. So once again, if we start associating with people and be, become unequally yoked, we're going to start giving up little things. It may not happen all at once, but it will end up happening. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30-32. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of uh, Nebat, that he took to, uh, took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Now, whenever you see that word, a, a portion of uh, anybody's name that has Baal in it, that is the very root of Baal's above. You can tell where that's going. That they are Satan worshippers. They're worshiping false gods. King of the Zidonians. And went and served Baal. Again, that's Baal's above. And worshiped him. That's Satan. And he reared up an altar to Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Wow. So let's look over here on the left, our little chart, real quick. So we're looking at Smyrna. Smyrna, uh, I know your works, tribulation, masquerade, they've got all these things going on. Pergamus, uh, he knows his, their works. But down at the bottom, we've got our little cartoon picture of Satan again. And all of them are suffering from both of these. They're suffering from syncretism. They're trying to blend the pagan practices of the culture of the day in with the Bible. We can't do that. It's either one or the other. And some of them just have plain out lawlessness. They don't care what the Bible says. And that is called anomianism. That is, well, I don't have to do what the Bible says. Um, because Jesus did it all. You'll hear this in some churches today. That, well, Jesus kept it all perfectly, so it doesn't matter what I do. I can live any way I want. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus, that God himself hates. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. And I gave her space to repent for fornication. God is so good. This woman's done everything she can against him, doing every sin that she could possibly do, and God gave her space to repent. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her go into, uh, commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So he still wants them to repent. And I will kill her children with death, and all the assemblies shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto everyone according to thy what? Their works. Works are important. Jezebel didn't repent. The people with Jezebel didn't repent. God paid them according to their works with death. Where do you think John got this? Well, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Because remember we talked earlier when we first started the study that in the book of the Revelation there's 800... Uh, excuse me, 404 verses. And in those 404 verses, there's at least 800 references to Old Testament Scripture. And that's what we're going to do right now. John got his uh, Revelation 21, or 2, verse 21 through 23, from Jeremiah chapter 17. 
I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, there's that wording, and give every man according to his ways. His ways would be his works. And according to the fruit of his doings. Wow. What did Jesus say? You will know them by your fruit. When people, when people say, oh man, why are you telling those people they're doing something wrong? You're judging those people. You're not supposed to judge those people. You know what I tell people? I'm not judging. I'm simply a fruit inspector. I'm inspecting your fruit. If your fruit is bad, then your tree is bad. What you're hooked to is bad. Your root is bad. But if your fruit is good, then your root is good. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteousness, for the righteous God tries the heart and the reins. That's Psalm 7 9 at the bottom of that particular page. Okay. Let's flip over to the next page. And on the far right hand side it says, ultimately the Lord will reward us based on our works. Works, I can't say this enough. I can't emphasize this enough. Works do not save us. You cannot do enough to get saved. It doesn't work that way. Your good works will get a, a good reward and evil works will get a horrible reward. That's a place called hell. Psalm 26 verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. That should be our prayer every day. God, look into my heart. Tell me where I'm doing something wrong. I mean, and if I'm doing it right, help me to know that too. Because I want to love what he loves and I want to hate what he hates. Psalm 62, 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou hast renderest to every man according to his what? His work. So if we do what God says do, God's going to reward us based on that. That's doing the Torah, doing God's instructions. That's the blessings in the life. If we don't, we get the curses and the death. Okay, back to Revelation chapter 2, verses 24 through 29. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, that is, there are some people that don't hold to this, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, burden, so, some of these people are actually doing what the Bible says to do. Isn't that true in most churches where you go to? There's some people that want to say, oh, I'm holier than thou, and, and I'm great. But then they go out and live like hell the rest of the week. And in others that really want to follow God. And they're made to feel guilty for wanting to obey God. But, th but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. So once again, Jesus will return. And he that overcomes and keeps my what? Works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And a vessel of a potter shall they be broken into shivers. Even as I receive to my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches or the assemblies. Wait a minute. I will give him the morning star. What do you think that is? Hmm. Let's find out. Psalm 2, verse 7 through 9. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son this day. Have I begotten thee? Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen of thine inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Wow. That's Jesus. That's Yeshua. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Now, that's, we're not there yet, but I'm going to go and refer to this because this actually points to us who the bright morning star is. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the assemblies. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So when in chapter 2, verses 29 there, it says, I will give him the morning star, the one who keeps my works. I will give him the morning star. Now, does that mean that we're going to just be handed Jesus? No. 
The word Jesus in English doesn't mean anything. But the word Yeshua does. In Hebrew, that literally means the salvation of Yah. So I will give you, if you keep those works, if you do what I tell you to do and you hold fast and you love me in your obedience, then I will give you the salvation of God. Wow, that's pretty cool. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And unto the angel in the assembly of Sardis write this. Okay, we're moving right along. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Wow, there's a lot of sevens. I know thy works. Oh, there we go again. Another works. That you have a name that you live and are dead. Do you know what? There's so many people that are more concerned with their name and they're dead because of it. They're not concerned with the name of God. They'd rather make it known that, that well, I did this. I did that. Or that's all because of me. Rather than admit that there's nothing that we can do without God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we're cut off from the root, we can't do anything but wither and die. Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are, uh, uh, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Once again, we're talking about those works, and not just any works, but perfect works. Now, does that mean we've got to do everything exactly perfect? No. You see, here's where our translations kind of get us into trouble. It's like today. We did some stuff today. People would look at that and say, Aha! You worked! You worked! Game over! You broke the Sabbath. No. The word perfection is uh, more of, along the terms of ethical, of being uh, honoring. You want to honor. That's the type of perfection that we're talking about. You know what? If, if, I, if I had my druthers, would I have been moving today? Nope. But you know what? When else can, in our culture can we do certain things? Um, we have a young lady that does the work on our dogs. She only works on weekends, and she's a single mother. I want to do good for that lady. So yes, I go out, and I let her work on my dogs, and I spend money on that day. Most people would look at me and say, Aha! You're a hypocrite! Because you broke the Sabbath. That's legalism. We don't want to do that. We want to honor God with everything that we do and everything that we say. If I can help somebody on the Sabbath, I'm darn well going to do it. Bro, your works are not perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, you shall not watch, I will come to you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come to you. Okay, of course, I had to... Borrow up. And again, I want to thank El Shaddai Ministries for this particular outline. This is where I got it. I got to tell you, I'm not a very original guy. I've added to this a little bit, but most of this came from El Shaddai Ministries. A really good place to check out. But it says, We'll come to you like a thief. What does that mean? You know, unfortunately, most of us do not understand the festivals of God. We don't, we don't understand it. You know, God's not going to come at some unknown time. We actually do know when he's coming. We, but we don't know exactly what year it's going to happen, but we know the season. And the Bible even tells us that too. You don't know the day or the hour, but you know the season. You who know the Torah, who know the law, you know the season. It's going to be in the fall. It's going to be on Yom Torah, the day of trumpets. Why? Because on the final trumpet call, that's when Christ returns and the dead in Christ are raised first. But... If we don't know our Bible, we don't know our festivals, we don't know our scripture, then it will come to us like a thief in the night because we're not watching for it because we've never learned. We've never looked at it. Psalm 28, verses 3 through 5. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their heart. Give them according to their deeds. There we go again. And according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the works of their hands. Render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord. 
nor the operations of his hand, he shall destroy them and not build them up. What does it mean that they regard not the works of the Lord? You know, God commands us to do certain things. Now, can we do everything that he commands us in the Old Testament to do today? Nope. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. 613 laws. And do you know 48% of those are directed right at the Levitical priesthood, the operation of the temple. So, is there a temple today in Jerusalem? No. There's certain things we can't do. So we can't do, uh, literally we can't do Passover. Passover is supposed to happen in Jerusalem. We can't do that. We can't do certain things. But can we celebrate these things? Can we remember them? Absolutely. We want to remember them. Because God is teaching us something through these. These are called Moedim, or holy convocations. They're special times of God. Uh, going back to Revelation, chapter 3, verses 4 and four through 6. You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. That's important. We're going to come back to that. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, uh, raiment and will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say unto these assemblies. So let's look real quick again at this. Defile their garments. Where does that come from? The fact of the matter is that when we get married, what color does the, does the bride wear? White. Yeah. White. So they're going to wear white garments. They don't want defiled garments. I mean, if you show up at a wedding and you've got a big pizza stain on the middle of your wedding dress, are you going to feel good about that? No. And as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, I can't remember if it's Jesus, but one of the uh, parables is that the king, in, in the days of old, the king would invite somebody to his son's wedding. And he knew that there were some poor people that couldn't afford a, a garment. And he wanted everybody on equal footing. So he would actually prepare a garment for all the people in his kingdom, in his particular realm. Everybody he invited, he would provide for them a garment. Some people would say, you know what? Thanks, king. But I want to wear my own stuff. Wow. So you show up with a defiled garment. That's not the king's garment. And if you actually look at this parable, the king comes up and says, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he's speechless. And the king says, Take, bind him, hand and foot, and cast him out into outer darkness where there's gnashing, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Wow, that's not good. So we want to have the right garments on. We want to be clothed in that white remnant. remnant. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others who show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. So, once again, that garment is stained by the flesh. Our fleshly desires to do what we want to do. Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against, uh, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai, the king's wedding garment. This is when... God calls down the Ten Commandments to all the people at the base of Mount Sinai. He wants them cleaned up and ready to go. This is Pentecost, the very first Pentecost. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 8, And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. See, if we don't understand the culture of the day, if we don't understand how they did their weddings, then we're not going to get this. We're going to get strange apparel. What, did, what, did he have a Batman t-shirt on or something? That would be strange apparel for most people, but not for me. But, again, that's why it's so important for us to understand all this. Matthew uh, 22, verses 
12 through 13. And he saith unto them, Friend, how came you here? Oh, here we go. I forgot I put this in there. How came you here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's in Matthew. So once again, when we want to do things by the flesh, when we want to do things our own way, this is called a social gospel. You know what? We go to church just to be seen, just to hang out. Some people go there to make sales. I've known lots of people that do that. Oh, yeah, there's lots of people there that might want to buy a house or need some insurance or whatever. So this is a social gospel. I want to give you an example here of the social gospel on your page here. And again, this will be uploaded to the website a little bit later today. This is an example of the social gospel. This is why it's legal to burn the American flag. You can, you can go out and you can burn the American flag. But an Iowa man is sentenced to 16 years for, sentence, for, uh, for setting an LBGTQ flag on fire. 16 years. What is our world come to? But wait a minute. Look down here at the bottom. An Ames man was uh, uh, sentenced Wednesday to about 16 years in prison after he set fire. See that underline right there? To a church's LGBT flag in June. A church's LGBT flag. That is the social gospel. That is where we are today. Now, as we look at Revelation, does any of this apply to us today? I mean, we've looked at quite a few churches so far. History repeats itself, just like we talked about in Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that hath been, it is that shall be again. And that which is done, it is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So let's do a little quick uh, rundown of where we are. The Assemblies of Sardis, who have the seven spirits of God. Oh, by the way, the seven spirits of God, if you're interested in where that's located, that's located in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, that was something that kind of confused me at first. I was like, what are the seven spirits of God? But it talks about how the different uh, articles of God are in that. And I thought I put this in my notes, but apparently I didn't. Anyway, but that's Isaiah 11 verse 1. Who has the seven uh, spirits of God, the seven stars, I know your works, and you have a name that you live and are dead. So they're more, they're more concerned with their name. Be watchful, strengthen what remains, and, and is ready to die. You know, some people, they have a little bit of faith, but if they continue on the way they're going, that little bit of faith that they have left will die. Your works are not perfect before God. Remember how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. If you don't watch, I'll come as a thief. And you will not know what hour I come. A few of you have not have uh, a few of you have undefiled garments. A few. What does the Bible say? The road to damnation is broad, many or most will find it. The road to salvation is narrow. Few will find it. Right, there's another example of that. Who overcomes will be clothed in white remnant, raiment, and their name will not be blotted out from the book of life. So if we look down here at the bottom, on our little sheet here, it gives a kind of little overview. Ephesus lost their first love, but they, they still hated the doctrine of the lawless church, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Smyrna, they had masquerading people that were hypocrites attending. Then we have Pergamon, Satan's dwelling place. Wow, how would you like to be a part of that assembly? Hey, Satan dwells here. They have syncretism and lawlessness. Again, they're the blending. And we've got to remember, too, why that's bad. God said, I would rather you be hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's the blending of things. God hates the blending of things. Then we have Thyatira. The church that accept, accepts false prophets teaching syncretism. False prophets like Jezebel, things like that. And then we have the social gospel, the church of Sardis. The church promoting their own agenda 
and not God's. Wow. This is why studying the book of Revelation is so important to us today. So we can not only know it for ourselves and do better for ourselves, but I mean, how many people do you think know this? Did you guys know any of this before we started the study? You want to know something else? Neither did I. When I go to teach, there, there's no time that I learn more is when I go to teach them, because I love to study. When, if you want to really learn, then, then focus on somebody you want to teach this to, and you will learn more than you ever could think about. It's amazing how that principle works. And I want to thank Bill Schneider at Northside Christian Church, who actually pushed me into the men's bros group to teach the very first time, because that's what started this whole, whole ball rolling. <laughs> He's a nice guy. But anyway, does anybody have any questions? I know we kind of breeze through this a little quick. I'm trying to keep it condensed down to under an hour because I know if we go over an hour, it's a little bit hard to keep up. But I think we're learning quite a bit. I know I'm learning quite a bit, and I'm really enjoying our time together. So let's go ahead, and since I didn't start off with prayer because I was running late and forgot my notes, thank you for being patient with me. Let's go ahead and end with prayer. Abba Father, God of creation, God of salvation, Father, we just love you. We praise your holy name. Thank you for your word. Thank you for opening your word to us so we can know you in a more adequate fashion. Lord, thank you that we live in a country that we can still, that we can still praise you openly while we can still praise you openly. Father, we love you. We praise your holy name. Father, help us to live out your word and be the light of the world the way Jesus calls us to be. Let our light shine. Your light, your, your word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. Help us to be that light for others this day. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus, Yeshua's holy name that we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Thank you all very much. And for those of you on Facebook, thank you again for watching. If you would like your own copy of this uh, notes, I will have it uploaded to the website shortly. And be sure if you have any questions, you can holler at me at jim at mrbatman.com or just go to mrbatman.com. All my contact information is on there. Also, do not forget to come by Java Station and get some of the best coffee on the planet. We call it the best brew in the burg. Not to mention, what did you have, Cassie? What did you have there? What was that? That sweet thing that you just had there? Cinnamon roll. A cinnamon roll. Oh, man. They've got everything here. They don't just have coffee. They have all kinds of good stuff. So stop on by. Tell them Mr. Batman sent you. God bless and have a great day.